Good morning. If you will notice, in what we call the atheist countries today, that the atheists are actually those who are in some way in government. The upper brackets of society in those countries and that the masses are still religionists the masses are still crying for churches and for their old religions and as always the masses are stupid The atheists aren't smart in being atheists, but they are smart in having coming, come to the conclusion that there is no such God as religion teaches. They have awakened to the fact that there is no such God as is taught in the religions of the world, and they have the courage to throw it out. If they actually believe there is no God, of course, they're more than stupid. But I doubt very much that there is an atheist on earth who believes there is no God. I'm convinced that they have only awakened to the fact that there is no such God as has been preached to them. And indeed there isn't. When we come to a place in our spiritual development, when we realize how impossible it must be for there to be such a God, or when we acknowledge that the God of the last 4,000 years or the gods that have been worshipped in the last 4,000 years, Hebrew gods, Christian gods, Buddhist gods, just are not answering the prayers of people, are not wiping out wars on earth or bringing peace on earth. Whatever of longevity is being demonstrated today and in this last half century human life expectancy has gone from 40 some years of age to beyond 70 but by increased knowledge in uh, materia medica in different forms a better understanding of foods, cleanliness, sanitation. To each one of us, there comes a difficult moment Unfortunately, that moment lasts longer than a moment. It may last days, weeks, or months before we can suffer through that agonizing period of recognizing that we and the world at large have been deceived with concepts of God, erroneous concepts, false images,
to the extent that at least one half of the ministers of a large denomination are willing to admit that a new image of God must be presented to the people. Why? Because that which has been presented has not been God, but an image, and a false image. As false as the golden calf of the Hebrews of old. And as the golden calf had no capacity to answer the prayers of the Hebrew, so the gods of these last 4,000 years have had no power because they were as false as the golden calf. It isn't easy after you have been steeped in centuries of worship and adoration of a false image to come to a place in consciousness when you can acknowledge it and ask yourself what is God? What is God? Not who. That would be bringing up another false image. Substituting one false image for another. But what is God? What is omniscience? What is omnipotence? What is omnipresence? Think for a moment of the word omnipresence. All presence, presence filling all space, presence where I am, whether I make my bed in heaven or whether I make my bed in hell or whether I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I am in the presence of God. What is that presence of God that is with me in heaven or hell or death. It is even said not even death, life nor death, can separate me from the love of God. What is this omnipresence which is at the same time all power and all wisdom. What is it? As you can maintain this question in your mind without fear, without fear that there is any God going to punish you for it, as you can divest yourself of faith in that which has never warranted your faith and seek an answer to the question, what is this presence that is always with me whose pleasure it is to give me the kingdom, that which knoweth my need even before I do, that which goeth before me to make the crooked places straight, that which prepares mansions for me. What is it? because it hasn't done all of those things. What is it? It hasn't, because we haven't understood the nature of it, what it is, how it functions, and the nature of the prayer that unites us 
with it. If we haven't the courage to acknowledge that what has been given to us in the past 4,000 years has not stood up, has not answered, has not functioned, we never will be ready for the next step We must empty out the vessel of our false beliefs and faiths and images in order that we may be refilled with truth. Has the world shown forth any evidence of an omnipresence of a divine presence an infinite power of good an infinite power of eternal life health wholeness harmony peace abundance No, not individually and not collectively. Individually, in all ages, there have been some few and some few followers of some few who have attained the wisdom, the understanding, and the actual demonstration of omnipresence. Just because the gods of this world have failed the world, or just because the people of the world have failed the one God, let us not make the mistake of atheists and believe that there is no God. Let us rather acknowledge that we have not sufficiently searched and sought, but rather we have accepted the beliefs, the opinions, the theories that have been handed to us without questioning for ourselves. If freedom has any meaning at all, The most vital meaning must be the freedom to think, the freedom to seek, to search, the freedom to question, the freedom to discover, until we do arrive at the goal we are seeking. And that goal is life harmonious why should we for a moment deny that that is our goal individually even in being here in this room why should we deny for a single moment why not be truthful and acknowledge to ourselves and to each other that we are here but for one purpose and that is seeking life eternal, seeking that which will bring peace on earth to all men throughout all time, seeking that which will ensure freedom so that freedom never again can be at the mercy of man whose breath is in his nostril. Why not acknowledge that our only hope is that we may find that which in setting us free individually will prove to be that which ultimately will embrace the entire world and set the world free. Because if someone doesn't find the secret of freedom, 
How can freedom be given to all? Has it not always been this way that one individual discovered some truth and then through that individual the world became aware of it? Whether it was a spiritual truth or one of invention, science, discovery, Always it has been one individual to make the discovery and then rapidly for that discovery to benefit all mankind. So it is that it should be the function of every individual who has been turned by the grace of God to the spiritual path to seek and to search until he arrives. Because if only one of us accomplishes this, it will set the entire world free. Just as the Wright brothers freed us from the limitations of the earth, Edison freed us from the limitations of darkness, the forest freed us from the limitations of space and hearing. Those who discovered the instruments of navigation certainly have freed us from the limitations of confinement. So, one individual discovering the secret of omnipresence, for this is the word, omnipresence. What is it that is present where I am that I cannot see, hear, taste, touch, and smell because throughout all time no one has ever seen it, heard it, tasted it, touched it, or smelled it. Otherwise, it would have been discovered before now. Otherwise, it would have been discovered by others than the mystics who attained it. What is it, then, that is present where I am? Whether I am comfortably situated here or whether I may at the moment be in some hell of sin, false appetite, disease, age, or even death, what is it that can set me free? And in setting me free, release all mankind from slavery, from bondage, to the five physical senses, from bondage to the limitations of the human mind. I asked a medical man, this question, what makes it possible for us to stand erect? What makes it possible for us to stand on our feet? And his answer was, our muscles. What becomes of our muscles when we faint, when we become unconscious, when we die? Do we not have muscles? Yes, yes, we still have muscles. Then why aren't we standing erect? Or why can we not stand erect? We have the same muscles when we're 
fall asleep. Same muscles when we fall unconscious. Now this, this answer, muscles, represents material sense, because to material sense this is true. We stand because of our muscles. The firmer our muscles, the harder, the longer we can stand. But once you have touched this other realm of consciousness, spiritual consciousness, you will discover that the muscles cannot keep you erect. So that you won't have to search as many years for the answer as I did, I'll give you the answer. The answer is the word consciousness. Consciousness enables you to stand erect using the muscles as instruments. There is nothing in the throat or mouth that can speak. You may have all that is therein and not have speech because the muscles of the mouth and throat and lips cannot speak. Consciousness using these instruments consciousness is the secret of life consciousness is the secret word consciousness is the ultimate consciousness is the absolute consciousness is the creative source, presence, power, law, cause. Only when you reach the word consciousness do you have the entire secret of life. You cannot even have health without having first a consciousness of health. It is for that reason that our work in the infinite way is not demonstrating health for anyone, but rather demonstrating for them the consciousness of health. There is no way spiritually to demonstrate supply for anyone regardless of how much money you may bring to them. It isn't supply because even the largest amount of supply has a way of withering away. But you can bring to an individual or to this world a consciousness of supply and then they will never lack. Those who attain the consciousness of health have health. Those who have the consciousness of supply have supply. Those who have a consciousness of music have music. Those who have a consciousness of art have art. Now you may have the same body that a concert pianist has or a violinist or musician of any instrument. You have the same body, the same brains, the same arms, hand and feet. You have it all. But you probably will never be a concert musician. Certainly not. Unless and until you attain the consciousness of the mastery of music. Anyone can learn to drive an automobile, <coughs> uh, 
as you can prove by the fact that more people have been killed by automobiles than by wars. But learning how to drive an automobile does not make you an automobile driver, and those accident figures prove it. Not everyone that can change gears and put their foot on the gas pedal and stop a car and park it is a driver. A driver is one who has a consciousness which governs the mind, thought, reflexes of the body. Without that consciousness, you have the potentialities of what happens on our roads. Business, just count the bankruptcies in every year and you'll know how easy it is to go in business and how difficult to remain in business. Because it takes more than a sum of money. It takes consciousness. Now, the highest form, the basic consciousness, is the spirit. That which gives to us our wisdom, guidance, intuition, direction, that which even gives to us the reflex actions of the muscles. To understand consciousness will eventually enable you to understand the nature of omnipresence because it is consciousness that is omnipresence. Without consciousness you merely have the five physical senses and a human reasoning power based on experience. But with consciousness you have access to the infinite wisdom, strength, power, government of God. The infinite, the eternal, the immortal. With this comes an understanding of the nature of prayer. Now, in our sense world, there is a person called I, I, Joel, for example, and I, Joel, want to do something, desire to do something, would like to do something, and if I'm not religious, in the orthodox sense of the world, I try to do it myself. I think, I plan, I hope, I save, and sometimes I get somewhere never achieving the fullness of what I have in mind. Or if I do, I find it to be unsatisfying, sometimes even frustrating. If I am religious in the orthodox sense, I pray to God to help me. And I actually expect that there is a God that is going to help me do my will, get me my way. Of course, I am not considering, up to this moment, whether what I am desiring or wanting is for my ultimate good or will enhance the happiness of my family 
or will improve the world or even if it will not in some way harm some who are in the world. Many times a success in business means the failure of someone else. Heedlessly, I pray to this false image of God to prosper me in my way. Or my nation, when it is at war. Or my nation, when it is embarked on an erroneous economic program. Nevertheless, I pray to God for its success. And I pray in vain. With the first glimpse of the word omnipresence, there dawns in thought this. Whatever this omnipresence is, it formed this universe. We have approximately seven-eighths water and one-eighth land, and undoubtedly there is some reason for this. The stars, the planets move in certain orbits, and since this has been true for as many years as has been known, there is, must be a reason for this. In other words, this omnipresence that formed this universe must at the same time be a divine intelligence, an infinite intelligence, even if we look at the human body. No individual planned this system of heart, liver, lungs, and blood system, brain and nerve system. No human thought that up. No human laid that out on a planning board. There must be an intelligence that formed this human body. The human or natural laws of like begetting like, apples from apple trees, cotton from cotton plants, fish from fish, birds from birds, animals from animals, humans from humans, whites from white, black from black, and if you combine them, a combination of white and black. This is law. But man never made this law. Therefore, that which is omnipresence and is the creative power and law and substance and intelligence, this is omnipresence. And so we may say it has a plan. Prayer, which in, in material sense is seeking to have God help us in our way and perform our will, now becomes not my will be done, but thine. Thou performest that which thou has appointed for me to do. Therefore, I cannot seek thy help for my way, but I can seek thy help to establish thy way in me, through me. This is the prayer of attunement the prayer of at one meant 
the prayer of union with God. You see, you cannot pray to become at one with God because I and my Father are one. This was the divine plan in the beginning and that oneness is already established. But, again, the word consciousness. Until you are consciously one, the relationship of oneness is not functioning for you. And to become consciously one means only to surrender my will. Let me be the instrument for thy will, for thy purpose. Probably because the sun, moon, and stars can't think. They are un always under the government of God. But we think our way into a sense of separation. Get the word sense. We never become separated from God in life or in death. We never become separated from God in purity or in sin. We never become separated from God in wisdom or in ignorance. But through taking thought we have built a sense of separation from God which acts the same as if it were an actual separation. It is the same as if we had a fortune but had lost our memory of it, our sense of it, we would be as poverty-stricken as if we had no fortune. And indeed, we have a fortune, the good fortune of being one with infinity. How much more fortune could we have than access to infinity, eternality, and immortality, and all in one way only not by praying for it, by attaining a consciousness of it, by at oneing ourselves. The declaration, I and my Father is one, is as false an image as praying to the golden calf. Unless in the declaration that I and the Father are one, I am willing to acknowledge that the Father is greater than I. Never forget that. I and the Father are one, but the Father is greater than I. Therefore, as this I, Joel, can release himself of desires I and my father are one and thou the father within me performeth that which thou givest me to do thou dost not perform my will thou performest that which thou givest me to do therefore let me know Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. Let me know thy will, and I will walk in it, so that I can say with Paul, I live, yet not I. Christ liveth my life. Omnipresence is as available on the highways, on the battlefields, on the seas, 
என்ன ஏயா as uh, when we are tucked away in our mother's arms but you see the word consciousness here it is again unless we are conscious of omnipresence the sense of separation is operating material sense is a sense of separation from spirit consciousness cause the father spiritual awareness is living moving and having our being praying without ceasing in the consciousness of i and the father are one here where i am and thy will be done in me and through me thy grace is my sufficiency not my planning not my personal ambitions hopes thy grace is my sufficiency but to say thy grace is my sufficiency to help me do that which i want to do is sacrilege thy grace is my sufficiency as long as i am willing to be about my father's business freedom really has its origin then in our relationship to deity because there is no other freedom there is no other freedom on earth than that freedom which we attain through conscious oneness with our source it is true doctors can make us well and then we can get diseased again a truce can be signed and there'll be a temporary peace on earth and then there'll be war again noble men are born on earth a few at a given time and they bring to their generation political economic and religious freedom may i tell you that 23 civilizations have come and gone some of them far more advanced than this present one no one can give you your freedom except temporarily whether it's freedom of health freedom of art freedom of music freedom of religious worship freedom of political freedom economic freedom no one can give you this except as a temporary measure and then not to all remember how many centuries it's been since the chinese have known freedom since the russians have known freedom since the poles have known freedom think and then you will know that it isn't it hasn't been given to all men to know the freedom that we have had in the united states or the freedom that has been known in canada or england not all nations have known these freedoms not all of these nations have known noble men who at the same time became powerful men but you have witnessed and you are witnessing today that man cannot give you these freedoms not even when they bring into being such noble enterprises as the united nations 
these two must fail, have failed. Freedom comes through consciously establishing our oneness with our source and giving over our lives to this infinite source. In, for instance, that very passage, he performeth that which is appointed me to do. In other words, he performeth that the spirit within me, the omnipresent consciousness, performeth that which it has planned for me, has decreed for me. For there is a spiritual plan behind this universe, <coughs> and that spiritual plan embraces our freedom. Just remember that if one of us attains it, we have attained it for the entire world. One with God is a majority. One attaining the realization and demonstration of omnipresence at the same time demonstrates omnipotence and omniscience and just as the very moment that the Wright brothers flew 12 minutes, they set the world free from the limitations of the earth. Even though it has taken a span of a half century to bring us to our present development of air flight. When one attains spiritual freedom, he attains it for the entire world, even though it may take a century for the demonstration on earth of the fullness and fulfillment of this freedom. This freedom will come with the understanding of God as consciousness, consciousness as omnipresence, and that this consciousness is the consciousness of individual man. Never believe that the freedom will come while you believe that God is in heaven or in a holy mountain, or in a holy temple, or in a holy man, never believe that freedom will come while you believe that God is anywhere except omnipresence as the consciousness of individual man. When you are bound by some sense of limitation and turn to a spiritual practitioner for help, the help you get is the realization on the part of that practitioner that God constitutes your individual consciousness. And this sets you free from the universal belief that you are a man whose breath is in his nostril. It sets you free from the belief that you were conceived in sin and brought forth in iniquity. It sets you free from the belief that you are a mortal man with a mortal body. Just the realization on the part of the practitioner that God constitutes your individual consciousness, your soul, your mind, your being, and that even your body is the temple of the living God. This is what sets you free. Now, if this is true, or rather since this is true, demonstrably true, then do you not see that one individual or two or more gathered together or ten righteous men, only ten, 
knowing that God constitutes the consciousness of individual man will set this entire world free because the only slavery there is, the only bondage there is, is this belief that we are man, man, mortal man, insignificant man. One of the nation's great anthropologists and scientists has written in an article in Harper's Magazine, March 1964, that the limitation is in believing that we are man. Freedom comes when you realize your true identity. I and the Father are one. And in my conscious understanding of that oneness, I am free. Free from the dominion of man. Free from the dominion of sin. Sinful appetites free from the sin of limitation because in my conscious oneness with God I hear son thou art ever with me and all that I have is mine all that I have I I with which I am one is infinity Could we have immortal life if each one of us had a life of our own? No, life would end with the grave. It is only because I, the Father, and I, the Son, are one that I know that life began before birth, before conception, and life will continue after the grave. Unto eternity I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I will be with thee unto the end of the world. There's no such thing as an end of the world because as long as there is consciousness, consciousness will be expressed. There can be no such thing as unexpressed consciousness. That itself means unconsciousness. There can be no such thing as unexpressed consciousness. Therefore, as long as there is consciousness, consciousness will be expressing itself as a world, and as men and as women. But it will always be that infinite divine consciousness expressing itself individually. We are dealing with two worlds the world we live in when we live in the world of material sense, the world we live in when we rise above taking thought into the atmosphere of consciousness and live by receiving, attuning, by impartation from the infinite to the individual. Then we are living our spiritual life and neither life nor death can separate us from it all of this brings to the surface the word fear All who live in material sense know fear. There are no such things as heroes in the sense of people who do not know fear. 
There are heroes who perform great deeds in spite of their fear. Fear is the most natural. Well, after, after the thought of self-preservation, I suppose that fear, no, fear really is the foundation of that law of self-preservation. Fear is undoubtedly the major factor in the life that is lived in the five senses. We fear death. We fear accident. We fear war. We fear poverty. We fear sickness. We fear the results of sin. We certainly fear that calendar that's marking off the years. Fear. And freedom from fear can only come through the prayer of recognition, of oneness. As long as I and my father are one, and as long as I am living in a receptivity, I have nothing to fear. Regardless of what human situation or condition may arise as a temporary experience, I still have no fear because I am living in this omnipresence, knowing that since I have no will of my own, I have no doubt that infinity can perform its will. I can give you an example of this in the early experience of my work in the infinite way. When it began, <clears throat> without any students, and without any finances. And the one truth that I had to cling to was that I didn't make up this message. I didn't invent it. I didn't find it somewhere. It came to me from the invisible. And therefore, it must be the function of the invisible to perform whatever was needful. And this has been the one continuing truth that has been with me throughout these 17 years, that the infinite way was not mine, not my invention, I didn't make it up. Every principle has been given to me by impartation from within, even those that have been confirmed as age-long wisdoms, even those were not given to me from books, but from within. Therefore, that which has given it to me must be with me to perform whatever it wants to be done. And with this, this work has covered the globe. I don't have to rehearse to you now. the worldwide activity and receptivity to this message because you know it. But I can say to you that that which is responsible for this worldwide demonstration is the realization that the message came from the invisible, a gift of God, if you will, not to me, God can't have uh, any one individual that it so favors. Its intent is for human consciousness through me, if you will, not for me, through me. But it must perform all that is necessary on the human plane, whether it is financing, 
whether it is publishers, whether it is translators, editors, whatever it may be, even the uh, discovery of the tape recorder as an instrument for its worldwide work. Thank you for a